Number four, any new security system uh, structure rather is going to be prim built primarily by the insiders. What they are prepared to do, what leadership and thought they are prepared to do. Number five, what you're trying to do is create a certain degree of predictability about security so that there will be rules of the road and ways of measuring whether something is working or something is not so people can look forward. The Cold War, confrontation in Europe as between the United States and the Soviet Union did have a high degree of predictability as to what would happen and with certain things that were permitted and certain things that were not because of the common interest of not having humankind's last war. Uh, this system, this security structure can also provide a firebreak to prevent stresses and tensions from lapping over into open conflict. And finally, as a goal, it has to find a way to deal ultimately with the realities of regional societies, governments, histories, and relations among these countries, and that is undoubtedly the toughest of all. Now, what are the major requirements of such a structure? Number one, we have to get the Iraq endgame right and figure out what afterwards, as has already been mentioned, what role that Iraq will play in a broader security structure. A lot of countries are still wondering what about the Iraq in the future. Number two is Iran. We have to understand what our interests are in Iran, and they are not just about the nuclear file, and they are not even just about Iran's role with Hezbollah and uh, uh, Hamas, but they include what Iran might be prepared to do as it was in 2001 with what we need to be done in our interest in Afghanistan. And the same can be said about Iraq. We need to think in a broader framework with, against, uh, with regard to Iran. And we also have to consider what its minimal and acceptable interests uh, uh, might be to be part of being willing to play in a security structure rather than to be a spoiler. I would argue, at least up until this administration's beginning, we have played it dead wrong. We have been totally unwilling to consider any action by Iran which could lead us to give it security guarantees. If they do every single thing we want of it, we are still not prepared to cross that bridge, as we did with North Korea. I would argue if you're not prepared to do that, you're not serious. We also, of course, have to be prepared to confront Iran, to offer security guarantees to others or whatever is necessary. And yes, I think to do an awful lot to stop it from getting the bomb. I think we could probably have deterrence, but that's the world in which I don't want to live. Uh, third major requirement, dealing with asymmetrical threats, particularly terrorism. Number four, providing regional reassurance. Number five, yes, we also have to deal with the Arab-Israeli conflict, and particularly the relations between Israel and uh, the Palestinians, if only to gain support from Arab states in what we need to get done, and from European states. And yes, uh, we need to deal with regional tensions and conflicts and to account for external actors. Now, potential models and partners. I'm going to give it in shorthand. Potential, and, and these all have to be assessed, potential NATO involvement, Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, or NATO model, Partnership for Peace, United uh, European Union involvement, or a European Union model, a conference of, of security and cooperation in the Persian Gulf, Incidentally, which is contained, that is CFS uh, for uh, the Middle East, is, in, is already contained in the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, but nothing has been done. Using ASEAN as a model, using elements of the organization of the Islamic uh, Conference. Finally, we need a whole series of issues, uh, steps with regard to arms, arms control, and confidence building measures. Multilateral, political, and military commissions involving everyone, uh, including regional conflict and crisis prevention and management mechanisms, an incidents at sea agreement, a freedom of shipping agreement, counter piracy cooperation, counter terrorism compact, building on what the OIC has already done, but dropping its provision that uh, 
if you're involved in freedom fighting, that doesn't count. We need weapons inventories and weapons arms control. We need arms balance management, as Mr. Hokayam has already mentioned. We need a relationship between outsiders and local countries in terms of training, of getting the militaries able to do the right things. We're going to need some kind of outside pledges, guarantees of last resort, and an awful lot of non-military cooperation. I've just outlined a few elements. But they are things that I think in the U.S. self-interest can, if we begin down this road, could in time lead to circumstances in which we will be able to meet our requirements at lowered risks in terms of blood, treasure, and opportunity costs. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers. Uh, I think Bob Hunter has virtually guaranteed that this topic will be on the program next year as well. Uh, he's given us a lot to think about. I've got questions that really cover a, a wonderful range of topics. I'm going to start out with a kind of public events or a, a current affairs question. And I think perhaps, Emil, you're the one who mentioned it. So I wonder if there's more you could say about the bombings and airstrikes uh, between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. How will it disturb the region? Um, and how much attention should we as the United States or as outsiders be giving to this conflict? Could you say a few words about that? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. First, the Saudi incursion into Yemen is a response to what's happening there. And actually, the, the failure of preventative diplomacy and, and other efforts to convince the Yemeni government to actually get its act together and do a better job at it. Um, for the moment, I mean, it's really dominating the airwaves from what I see in, in, in the Middle East. Um, people are, you know, sometimes not very convinced by Saudi claims of Iranian interference. I tend to think that they may well be Iranian involvement there, maybe not as big as it is. Um, sorry, I'm Lebanese, and I tend to think that the Iranians have a hand in many of that. <laughs> I don't disagree. <laughs> Um, to, the question is whether there is a political plan um, that accompanies the Saudi uh, incursion. And for the moment, we haven't seen that coming from, uh, from Saudi Arabia. What, is, what are the objectives? Uh, how much are they coordinating with the Yemeni government? These are the questions we, we have in mind. Uh, crushing the insurgency altogether seems to me pretty unfeasible. I mean, we've seen insurgencies elsewhere prosper. And in, the U.S. knows that. Um, will it have an immediate uh, disastrous effect on regional security? I don't think so. I think it's still contained. Yemen is still pretty isolated geographically, that you don't have to worry about anything at a regional level soon. But the assistant uh, minister, uh, interior minister in Saudi Arabia was targeted by someone who was living in Yemen. So you have to think about the other consequences. Mm -hmm. 